got 928 Eastern. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Good morning, Ms. Robertson. Good morning. How are you? <clears throat> Very good. Good. Thanks for having me. Glad you did so. And uh, Savannah, just so you know, I mentioned to others, um, we're going to be recording this and it's also going to be live streamed on Facebook. I just want to give you a heads up. Well, just before we are uh, getting the, get into the meat of this and get started, just a little bonus for those that are here um, from recent analysis using um, the Athlete tool, which is something Argonne has developed uh, over a number of years using their online version and putting in TVA's current grid mix, or at least the graph on the 2020 grid mix and using an average gasoline vehicle that gets 22 miles per gallon. Uh, a fleet says it would be like a 78% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. If you move from driving that gasoline car to an electric vehicle in Tennessee and otherwise drive the new EV the same as you would have, same distance, et cetera, for the, the gasoline car you had before. So if you had not heard, and I mean, this is something that could be a completely different um, session where we could talk about things like this, but uh, yeah, it's uh, things have gotten pretty awesome if you're a Tennessean for your opportunity to, to uh, drive electric and the kind of impact you can have in the transportation sector where it's needed most. And I'm just checking for a few other people being with us and then we will get started in just a few minutes or a minute. Good morning, Laurel. Good morning. Thank you. We just want to check your audio. So we got you. Good morning, Jonathan. Can you hear me? I can, Mr. Haney. How are you, sir? Doing fine, sir, and yourself? Too blessed to be depressed. Glad to be here with you. Glad you are here with us. All right, so looks like I can check all but one or two people. Um, Raven, if you would unmute and just so we can make sure and check your audio. Hello. Good morning. Okay, great. All right. Um, I've got 931. We will go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. We very much appreciate your time today. Um, welcome to the first annual Drive Electric Tennessee Town Hall. Our intent with the the town hall today is to basically give you an opportunity to hear about a lot of different things that are going on um, in Tennessee with regard to driving electric and transportation electrification. What you're going to see is many short updates that generally are in the one to three minutes. So this is going to go pretty fast. What we have is we have it organized into three sessions. So each session will have a collection of presentations and then there will be a Q&A period at the end. Those are sometimes are 10 minutes, sometimes are 20 minutes. Um, we'll certainly feed off you guys and answer questions as much as we can up to that time. If we don't have very many questions, we'll go ahead and continue with the next session. Our intent is to be less than two hours uh, with this town hall. But again, as the first annual, the hope is to use this as just one tool in our toolkit to each year, maybe in summertime like now, to have a similar town hall and just talk about different things that are going on in the state and give people a flavor of the wide variety of things that are going on here. We will be monitoring the chat um, and also uh, muting folks if, if somebody 
perchance gets a, a call and doesn't realize they're they're on the on the phone with all of us, um, we will take care of muting you. Um, Susan Pusaro, who is on our staff, is going to be helping all our presenters as you have um, you know two or three minutes, and she's just going to say the word time when we get to the end of your time. Uh, Daniel 6A in our office is live streaming this on Facebook, and this is being recorded. So with that, um, I think we will go ahead and go to um, the first set of introductions, Sarah. And uh, I believe, uh, yeah, just quickly so everybody can see, this is the first of the three sessions, and it's kind of the DET overview plus um, a few other things, and it goes all the way from just explaining briefly what Drive Electric Tennessee is, if you're new to, to what we're doing here in Tennessee, talking about various aspects and things that are going on, including our working groups, uh, and then ending up with some information about a preferred in. dealer program, and an example of some pretty darn incredible EV communications in Tennessee. But up first is Alexa Wojtek. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Alexa Wojtek. I'm an Energy Programs Administrator in the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation's Office of Energy Programs, or the State Energy Office for Tennessee. I'm also a Clean Cities Coordinator for the Middle West Tennessee Clean Fuels Coalition, um, which is the sister coalition to East Tennessee Clean Fuels. Um, so here on this slide, you can see our Driver Electric Tennessee Executive Committee, as well as some of the key staff on the right-hand side that contribute to Drive Electric Tennessee. So in our executive committee, we have Drew Fry with TVA, Bill Copeland with EPB, Jonathan and Daniel with East Tennessee Clean Fuels, Brad Rains with TVPPA, myself and Ryan Stanton with the TDEC Office of Energy Programs, as well as Shauna Vasquez and Mark Finley with the TDEC Office of Energy Programs. And then on the right-hand side, you can see Ainsley Kelso, who's the Communications Coordinator, Sarah Roth, the Special Projects Coordinator, and Susan Fisara, the Fiscal and Membership Coordinator for East Tennessee Clean Fuels and Drive Electric Tennessee. So thank you all for joining today. Thanks, Alexa. Um, uh, if folks don't know, kind of DET really came together in, in 2019 with the finishing of the statewide roadmap. And we were able to create a position that was the Drive Electric Tennessee Coordinator um, and, and we had Virginia Salazar Buddha with it for about a year and a half. We appreciate her time and energies. Uh, and earlier this year, she decided to go back to school. So we started the uh, interview process and over the last few months have been going through that and recently uh, selected Savannah Robertson to join us. So we are very pleased to, to have Savannah getting started with us soon. And uh, she's with us here. I don't know if there's anything you want to say, Savannah, you don't have to, but if you Anything you want to say, you're welcome to. Uh, just excited for the experience. So here to help and do whatever needs to be done. So thank you. Look thank forward you. to working with you all. Happy to have you with us, Savannah. OK, I think next we are going into what is Drive Electric Tennessee with Daniel Sixa. Thanks. Um, so uh, as Alexa mentioned, I'm Daniel. Um, Chief of Staff for East Tennessee Clean Fuels and one of the folks who works on Drive Electric Tennessee as part of the administration. Drive Electric Tennessee is a statewide initiative that um, involves many organizations and individuals who all work together to develop electric vehicle awareness and adoption and research across Tennessee. This started as a discussion between multiple stakeholders to produce the Drive Electric Tennessee roadmap. And from there, the program has blossomed into something that is quickly, I think, becoming a, a uh, well, as close to a household name as a project like this can be. <clears throat> we um, now run uh, three separate working groups, uh, one for awareness, one for policies and programs, and one for infrastructure that all work on specific projects across the state. Some of those have been called from the roadmap, and some of those have come about organically just because we are... Uh, always paying attention to what needs to be done and kind of what our priorities need to be in Tennessee. But the ultimate quantitative goal for Drive Electric Tennessee is to see 200,000 electric vehicles uh, on Tennessee's roads by 2028. That's our goal. You'll hear later on about our progress in, in getting that number up. 
Um, but for now, I want to tell you a little bit more about the broad overview of what tennis, uh, Drive Electric Tennessee's goals are. And uh, Sarah, if you could switch to the next slide, thank you. Um, so we want to focus on economic development because electric vehicles are an economic opportunity for Tennessee, not least because many of them are actually produced here, batteries and vehicles. EVs create social benefits because there are emissions reductions in communities and there are also opportunities for individuals and fleets to save money and put that money back into their communities. EVs are cost effective. Uh, they typically cost approximately one third to one half of the cost to operate the similar electric or internal combustion engine vehicle. And finally, we want to make sure that Tennessee is on the forefront of technological innovation in the transportation space. Sustainable, uh, forward looking transportation is important to us. Tennessee has an opportunity to be one of the leaders in the country for implementing these technologies and we want to make sure that Drive Electric Tennessee helps push us there. You can visit driveelectrictn.org for information about all of our programs, all of our working groups. There's also EV 101 information and uh, information about how you can get involved either as a member or a stakeholder at one of our events. So Shauna, um, are you with us in connection? Yes. Hi, Jonathan. Sorry, I can't appear on camera today, but this is Shauna Vasquez with the TDEC Office of Energy Programs. Um, thanks for passing it over, Daniel. I, I just wanted to share with everybody um, some exciting trends that we've been seeing with T Tennessee EV adoption numbers. Uh, most recently, as of June 30th, 2021, we saw uh, growth in EV registration numbers to 13,811 vehicles currently registered in Tennessee that are either BEVs or PHEVs. As Daniel had said, the goal of Drive Electric Tennessee is to increase electric vehicle adoption to 200,000 vehicles by 2028. Now that does seem uh, like a pretty lofty goal, um, but we know that those numbers for EV adoption are continuing to increase, particularly as new models are coming available on the market, including those that are going to be or are currently manufactured in Tennessee, which would include uh, you know, the Nissan Leaf out of Smyrna, as well as new offerings from Chattanooga, Volkswagen with the ID4 all electric vehicle, and um, oncoming vehicles going to be produced at the GM Spring Hill plant um, for. Um, uh, Cadillac. So I just wanted to point out, um, although the growth is, is slow and steady, we are seeing growth. We continue to see growth even during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we hope are hopeful that we'll be able to meet our 2028 goals. I'll leave it off there, Jonathan. Thank you, Sean. Um, I think Sarah, you're going to follow up with a little bit more discussion on some of those numbers. Yeah, so these are just a couple more um, graphs kind of showing more of the, the makes um, that are currently available in Tennessee. I don't think it would surprise pretty much anyone um, that there are a lot of Teslas, but we always kind of, the number that gets thrown around is that around 70% of the um, EV market is Tesla's currently, and it's actually lower than that in Tennessee. It's only hovering around 40%. Um, and some of the OEMs, such as Nissan and Chevrolet, that have um, plants and things in Tennessee are increasing in numbers, which is always good to see um, EVs close to home and also have some more cost-effective models that are um, increasing in popularity, in addition to Tesla's obviously leading the pack. Um, so yeah, I'll give you a second just to kind of look at these. We cut it off to just the top OEMs. Um, and I think Nissan and Chevrolet are going to continue to really increase in popularity over the next few years and help us push us, push us towards the, the 2028 goal. And, and then we also expect to see VW ramp up. There's just some recent graphs that have also shown growth in VW. We're just not quite seeing that here yet. Mm -hmm. And these numbers will um, soon be available on driveelectrictennessee.org and we'll continue to update them as new numbers come out. And this is a map 
um, showing county by county, it's kind of hard to see. Obviously, um, around Nashville and Memphis, the numbers are fairly high, um, with Davidson and Williamson and Shelby County being um, the top three counties in Tennessee currently. Knox County is following close behind, and um, Chattanooga is getting up there as well. So um, we're working on a few projects that we'll talk about later to increase the numbers in the more rural counties. And this is as of the end of 2020 um, to try to see more widespread growth of EV adoption. And this is BEVs and PHEVs. Um, so hopefully we'll see numbers in all the counties rise, especially in, in the ones outside of the city centers over the next few years. Thank you, Sarah. I wanted to talk a little bit about the one of the biggest uh, promotional and awareness pushes that we have going on right now, and that is the opportunity for Tennesseans to register for a specialty EV license plate. This has been a project in the planning for over a year now. We've gone through multiple revisions and designs for our license plate. We've arrived through much discussion with many of our stakeholders and working group members at our final design. Uh, as of the end of May, we had uh, legislation passed to allow us to start introducing this license plate and collect registrations. And then we uh, were fortunate enough to have the opportunity from uh, one of our, our major stakeholders and, and fiscal supporters, uh, TVA, to be able to provide free specialty plate registration to the first 1,000 registrants for the first year. Uh, and so that program is happening right now. If anyone who's attending this webinar would like to sign up for an EV specialty license plate, uh, you can go to tnlicenseplate.com or to the Drive Electric Tennessee website and you'll be able to sign up right there. There is no cost attached for the first year of registration for the first 1,000 applicants. Once we have collected 1,000 registrations, we'll be able to submit those names to uh, the Tennessee government. And within three to six months, we should have plates printed and you'll be able to put them on your vehicle. I should uh, note that this is a great awareness campaign because obviously there's going to be hopefully thousands of vehicles driving around Tennessee with a drive electric license plate. But there's also an aspect of this that helps fund DET and the other projects that we work on. Approximately 50% of the funds that go towards registrations in the future will come back to Drive Electric Tennessee and enable, and enable us to continue working on the programming that we're doing across the state. Um, the, uh, the other aspect of this that's, that's uh, really important is that we are um, helping to make visible the work that we're doing in a different way. So not only is this an opportunity to raise awareness for EVs in general and point out, hey, I'm driving an EV, but it's also an opportunity for supporters of EVs to sign up because you don't need to drive an EV to sign up for one of these plates. If you are a supporter of sustainable transportation, if you are a supporter of electric vehicle technology, but do not currently have the option or the means to own an electric vehicle or lease an electric vehicle, um, then you can still sign up for one of these plates and support Drive Electric Tennessee and electric vehicle adoption in Tennessee in that way. Uh, there'll be opportunities for questions later on, but uh, many of your questions will be answered on tnlicenseplate.com. If you visit that site, you'll be able to register and learn more. Thank you, Daniel. And, and before I go into membership real quickly, I just wanna say for those of us that have paid attention to some other states that are working on license plates, it's not seemed to be an easy process and we've watched one that's gone through several years of trying to get to just 500 signatories. And to Drew's comment in the chat, I almost can't believe it, Drew. I mean, I just, that we, the Tennesseans have come on so strong for that to, I guess basically right now we're hitting the halfway goal. I just, I'm floored and just very happy that uh, um, we've got that far. We're, we're only halfway there. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't be too happy yet, but um, uh, it's amazing the response we've had thus far. So we, we will keep pushing that message to, to everyone and uh, just thank you to all of you all for being interested and know as well that we understand that, that people move. Every once in a while something happens to a car. Just don't be surprised if we internally start looking at a number at like 1100 to make sure we, for those people that, that, that we lose along the way, we're able to keep a thousand over time because that's one of the things we have to do uh, over the long haul. 
I had one more thing to add about the license plate. I just checked the numbers and we pulled those that 498 number this morning. As of approximately 30 seconds ago, we have reached 500 registrations for the license plate. Wow. All right, so we, we, we'll keep up the work on that. Let's get that thing in use. Um, so briefly on members and memberships, um, basically we, we have um, TVA and, and TDEC as, as really significant partners that got started in 2017, 18, to do a lot of work in the state. Um, TVA hired Navigant. There was a huge process 2018 into 2019 for developing the roadmap. But a lot of people across the state got involved with that process in multiple meetings in multiple cities. Um, but where that led us today is that the TVA has also supported this, the start, provided some seed funding for Drive Electric Tennessee to get started. Uh, one of the ways we need to make sure that this organization can be supportive to a number of different groups, initiatives around the state, be one entity that goes and seeks funding for particular projects, DOE and other funds, is to just make sure DET itself is financially um, stable as a, an initiative of East Tennessee Clean Fuels. So just want to thank all of these entities for becoming dues paying members this year. There's membership information on the website and that includes both um, business members and individual members. And those do come with benefits. And if there's something in particular that an organizational member is interested in, then any of the Drive Electric Tennessee staff can probably talk with you all about, you know, how we may be able to help you with one particular thing if you're more interested in that and some of the other benefits that are in your benefits page. But if you'll go to the next slide, um, yes. Basically, we really appreciate TVA getting us started, but it's gonna be an important mix of all the rest of the folks to, to help us get there. We are pursuing foundation funding, grant funding, um, and other sources of funds other than memberships, but memberships are gonna be an important part. So just know if you go to driveelectrictennessee.org, there's a way for both individual members as well as organizational members to look at what those benefits are and join. Um, individual members, you will note on the website that it says you will get some swag um, once you become a member. I think we have about 10 to 15 people that have already become individual members. We are just getting some of our swag that we've been working on over the last few months in. So Ainsley in our office is, it may be another month or six weeks before we send that out, but we will be sending that swag to our individual members. And I think for that, we're gonna go into working group discussions and let each of the working group leaders talk a little bit about um, what they've been doing. And so Drew, the floor is yours, sir. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm just going to give a little update on um, the infrastructure working group. And so uh, for those who have not been a part of the group uh, for over the last year or so, the infrastructure opportunity working group uh, was actually started back in May of 2020. So basically just a year old. Uh, and this working group provides an, an environment uh, where we encourage collaboration, networking opportunities. And it's just a place where we can discuss you know, high level EV charging infrastructure activities and projects. Uh, we meet uh, monthly. In fact, I think we meet tomorrow. Um, but each meeting, we typically have a member of the group or a special guest come and talk about their company um, and infrastructure projects that they might be working on right now to build uh, chargers out in, in uh, Tennessee and in the Southeast in general. And the goal of our group is to develop charging infrastructure that enables Tennesseans to drive and charge their EV in their daily lives. So this is, you know, home charging, workplace charging, public charging opportunities. Uh, but we also include conversations about ac giving access to electric public transit and other kind of modes of transportation that um, can be electric. We have three main focal points. We, we look at infrastructure coordination and planning. So, you know, if something's going on and multiple people are working on infrastructure projects, we don't want to duplicate in, you know, uh, when money could be spent other, wares, other places. And we look at infrastructure build out where we can. And we look at standards and maintenance. You know, are charging stations being maintained? Should there be recommendations? Uh, do things need to be fixed? Stuff like that. 
Uh, beyond just our meetings this year, we also worked with the Atlas Public Policy Group to draft a site host guide. We can share this guide with potential charging sites um, that might be interested in installing EV charging infrastructure. Uh, it has, you know, frequently asked questions like how much does it cost to install a charging station? You know, what can I, can I charge people for it? Things like that. We have 23 members on our group. Uh, we have seven utility company members like TVA, uh, Nashville Electric Service, KUV, Knoxville Utility Board, Bright Ridge and Johnson City, Electric Power Board of Chattanooga and Memphis Light, Gas and Water. We also have Seven States Power Corporation who works with local power companies installing charging infrastructure. We have state agencies like TDEC and TDOT, cities like the city of Knoxville, East Tennessee and Alabama Clean Fuels Coalitions, Tennessee Tech University. And we have lots of engagement from industry peers such as Nissan, Earthrides, EVGo, Gil Barco, Cape Electric, and many others. So we're um, excited about the work that we're gonna be working on trying to encourage more EV charging infrastructure because we know that is super important for folks who are driving EVs and folks who are considering to buy EVs. Hi. Thank you, Drew. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, myself and Shauna Basquez from the TDEC Office of Energy Programs are the co-chairs for the Awareness Working Group, and we work with a fantastic team. Um, as diverse as the list that Drew, Drew had mentioned as well, we have local um, power company representatives, EBSE representatives, EV drivers and advocates of all kinds. And we've been working on multiple projects in the past year to uh, boost awareness of uh, electric vehicles in Tennessee. Obviously, I've already talked about the license plate, but I'll plug that URL one more time, tnlicenseplate.com to register. But we've been working on a lot of stuff. Um, our, our digital presence for Drive Electric Tennessee has grown rapidly. We have we're approaching a thousand members of our DET discussion group on Facebook, and that's discussion for all things electric vehicles that are relevant to Tennessee. Um, our our driveelectrictennessee.org website is now currently seeing approximately 2,000 vis visitors per month, and so those efforts are going really well. Um, we've also been working on a uh, dealership education program, and Shauna's uh, task force within uh, within the awareness working group has been working on developing out a program for helping reaching out to dealers and making sure that they have the resources they need to be able to effectively sell and explain the details about electric vehicles. We have developed uh, guides for creating DET chapters and you'll hear a little bit about that um, a little bit about that later and uh, in addition to that guides for running ride and drives. There's also been a lot of work done in developing chapters themselves, and Jonathan can give an update about that later. Uh, not to mention that we've developed uh, signage guidance for uh, in city and at stations for marking out things like making sure that EV uh, charging, charging stations are accessible to EVs and don't get quote unquote iced. Um, the other thing that we're working on that uh, you'll hear a little bit about later is our preferred. We want to make sure that we know the dealers in Tennessee who are doing the great work of selling EVs effectively in Tennessee. And we want to push and promote them to make sure that consumers and other fleets and organizations who are looking to purchase EVs in Tennessee can go to dealers that are trusted and able to sell EVs effectively with the details and education that they need, that they need to do so. Uh, we work with a fantastic team. I'm so happy with our awareness program. It's a pleasure to work with all of you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Laurel, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning. I'm Laurel Creech, and I'm the co-chair of the Policies and Programs Committee, along with Alexa Wojtek. And uh, very similar to Drew, we have an amazing group of probably over 25 members, very similar in representation from utilities to the private sector, to city and state representatives, organizations such as SACE, um, and so many others that are contributing to developing our policies and programs. One of the things that we're most excited about is our local action plan. So we're putting together a local action, it's actually a playbook for municipalities of all sizes on how they can develop an electrification strategy and plan and implement that. 
Uh, so we have it actually in a video format. So uh, we are really excited. We've got the first chapter completed. Uh, it's been filmed, scripted and filmed, and now we are, uh, we've are we got scripts for the next two chapters and are working on finalizing scripts for the rest and the remainder of the video. Um, and then we'll be working with an entity to actually film it. The different chapters of the local action plan include an introduction and overview, which is the one that's complete. You can see a snapshot of that on, that, on your screen. Uh, chapter two is working with your local utility. Chapter three is creation of transportation electrification plan, which includes both municipal fleet as well as public transportation. And then number four is promoting charger access and infrastructure development. Chapter five is municipal targets, then equity and access, and then education and outreach, which will all obviously align with the awareness committee, and then just incentives and funding opportunities as well. So really excited about getting that done. We're hoping it will be useful uh, for cities of any size and will be a really good, um, not only educational piece, but hopefully a toolkit to be used. And you can, you can uh, click each chapter depending on what specific areas that you want to focus on. Um, in addition to that, we had two other programs that we have completed. Uh, we did complete a workplace charging um, a toolkit, and that's very step-by-step -step if you have a workplace of any size on how you go ahead and prepare for installing EV infrastructure and infusing a, uh, a culture of electrification within your employees. And then in addition to that, um, we also have another committee that's been working with the Department of Tourism Development for e EV IP rollout. And there's been a, a memo distributed and conversations ongoing around that. So that is um, the biggest, biggest um, accomplishments thus far. We are continuing, as I mentioned, with the local action plan, and then we'll be taking on a few other additional uh, strategies and goals as we move forward through the next year of Drive Electric Tennessee. So thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Um, real quickly, just if you'll repeat for those that may not have caught it, what EVIP stands for? Um, it, it's a electric VIP. So um, it's specifically around tourism and transportation and, and the tourism industry supporting electric vehicle charging station rollout and culture of EV adoption. Gotcha. Just an electric VIP. I got it. Okay. Thank you. All right, great. Um, so moving from working groups into a couple of final pieces before we are done with the first session, one of those is a preferred dealer program. Um, this came out of something I think the team wanted to work on. And we kind of know, at least in the US and probably everywhere on planet Earth, dealer education and, and having dealers helpful and not uh, turn folks that go to a dealership away from electric vehicle is a pretty critical piece of, of one of the things we need to work on. Um, through the Drive Electric USA program um, project, DOE funded project that we are a part of, there's 14 states sharing some ideas on this stuff. So we, we are not quite done with fully rolling out the preferred dealer program, but we've got probably 80% of our pieces together. Some materials are left to be created and put on the website, but we want to, both create something that can be information for dealers to learn how to become a preferred dealer. And we understand that they are busy, have a lot going on. So there's a, a small set of things we require and then a larger set of things that are um, um, opportunities and option, optional things they can do. And then there'll be another piece that's consumer facing. If you live in Clarksville or Chattanooga or Bristol, and there are preferred dealers in your area, you'll be able to go to the Drive Electric Tennessee website to that section and look for those preferred dealers and find some contact information for who the lead person at that dealership is. So along the way, um, Ainsley recently was able to meet Josh Stansberry of Reader Chevrolet, which is on the north side of Knoxville. And we were basically shocked Josh has been doing so much stuff with his staff and at the dealership that we wanted to give him a minute to talk a little bit about what uh, they've been doing. So Josh, if you want, the floor is yours, sir. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Um, I'm the uh, general sales manager here at Reader Chevrolet. I'm a uh, partner. Um, 
my the the uh, the other partner we both drive uh, bolts we we're trying to kind of lead the charge um, in the dealership and uh, get everybody accustomed to the vehicles that I think the uh, biggest thing about the EVs is they're they're coming soon much faster than the average customer expects and we definitely want to be a, a leader and, and be ready for them um, in 2020 we sold about 25 bolts uh, and we had basically the same strategy uh, to sell them as we did for the rest of our inventory. We stocked as many as, as GM would give us. Uh, we offered the biggest discounts around and uh, basically just tried to move them in volume. And, you know, even though it was, that was the most in, in the state of Tennessee, it still seemed pretty low. Uh, so we, we started working on a, a, just a unique strategy for the EVs. Uh, so far this year, we've sold 37. So we've more than doubled our, uh, our sales pace. And we, uh, we did that by allocating some, some money for Google. Um, everybody's digital nowadays. You start shopping from your phone. So we, we spend money, you know, anybody that Googles anything about an EV within about a 200 mile radius, we make sure that our URL uh, pops up. Uh, we, we started educating the sales employees. Um, I designated a bolt um, for basically uh, customers, employees to spend three days in. Uh, we call it our 72 hour test drive vehicle. Uh, they get to basically take it for three days, you know, run their, their daily commute and just see how it works for them. Um, a lot of my guys embrace the idea. You know, some of the guys, you know, they, they hated to leave behind their cool car, cool truck. You know, everybody's, everybody's vehicle is a personality uh, reflection. But once they got into it and got, the vehicle, got familiar with the vehicle, it was amazing. You know, even, even the big truck guys, you know, how, how much they enjoy driving these vehicles. You know, it's, it's kind of like uh, getting to play with the latest iPhone, you know, there's just so much technology packed into them. Um, I, I got everybody on board, you know, basically I told my, my sales force, hey, if you don't, you know, if you don't spend the time to learn the vehicle, you can't sell them. So, you know, that that pretty much got everybody on board. Um, another issue we had was was trying to get just the traditional um, gasoline customers, you know, just a little bit of an education on the on the thing. The biggest question that we'd run into when a customer would, uh, we'd, we'd, you know, show them an EV was, you know, how do I charge it? Um, so we, we, we decided we would take care of that problem. So we started throwing in the level two chargers with every um, EV cell. Um, I keep them in stock in my parts department. Uh, basically, when a customer goes through the, uh, the finance department and they come out, they, they take delivery of their new bolt. They've got their uh, level two charger in the vehicle. Uh, they come with a level one portable. So all they've got to do really is get the, uh, get the thing installed at their, at their house. And, and it's, it's made a difference. Um, we also tried to get as many customers as possible in the uh, 72 hour test drive vehicle just to, you know, just so they could see, you know, 250 miles. That's that's a pretty good, you know, pretty good range. You know, most most, most the average commutes 40, 50 miles a day. So, you know, most people can make that work. Um, the uh, the chargers, you know, we negotiated a, a volume discount from our suppliers um, and when we were coming up with some strategies, you know, we wanted to utilize basically the, we, what we feel is the biggest advantage we would have over uh, Tesla, and that's just having a physical dealership. Um, you know, if we do it right, we roll out the red carpet for the EV customers, you know, try to give them a five-star experience. Um, we, we, you know, we had kind of have a leg up there. Uh, we converted an unused um, entrance and kind of an old um, Allstate lounge that we, we used to use for uh, selling insurance into our EV lounge. Uh, we, we, you know, cleaned it up, painted it, put artwork up. Uh, we've got water, coffee. Um, we use an office beside it to display the bolt accessories and as much information, EV information as we can. Uh, we've got flyers about the KUB $400 bill credit. We hand out um, just literature, you know, any, any literature we can give to, uh, to customers that are buying or thinking about buying. Uh, we installed a DC fast charger outside of the lounge and we put eight level two chargers outside of the lounge. And we basically just invite um, all of our customers, any customer really to, you know, pull up, charge, um, enjoy the lounge and, and, you know, just visit, say hi. Um, our, our gas customers, we've always emailed out and gave them free, free five oil changes to try to get them back in the dealership. So if, uh, as soon as we started selling a lot of EVs, I had a customer say, hey, I don't need oil changes. You know, what, what do I get? So we, at that point, we, we started throwing in lifetime tire rotations just to make sure we can get these customers back in the dealership. You know, we can keep a relationship and, and see them, you know, when it's time to, to sell them tires, you know, if they're here, they'll, they'll get. Time. Us 
Um, our EV, you know, initiative is, is, is evolving. We've got a, a, a mural that we use. We paint it up. It's fun. The salesman used to, to take pictures of customers when they sell, when they buy their vehicle. We post it, but it's kind of a uh, gas lane. It's, it's, it's got, you know, cams, pistons, uh, exhaust. So it kind of feels, doesn't feel right when we're taking pictures of our EV customers in front of it. So I've got another um, local artist that's working on an EV mural for us. That'll kind of uh, finalize the uh, you know the, our little area, but uh, other than other than that, we we plan on doing some short commercials for our social. Um, just looking to you know any anything you guys can do to help. We we love the idea of the preferred dealer program. Um, that I think you know I think we can help each other there. Uh, we've got a really good facility, easy to easy to get to. Um, we'd be happy to host you know some of the ride and drives, um, the EV ride and drives, but. Uh, biggest thing, like I say, is just getting cut more customers in in these vehicles, and you know, if they give them a chance, it's it's hard hard not to uh, buy one of these cars. Well done, Josh, and I know the vast majority of our attendees are on mute, so I'm going to clap for everyone. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, just Thank outstanding you. Outstanding work, and so we we are close to Q and A, and I see that we've had some questions in here, and Ainsley, we'll get there. There's a thumbs up from Pingan. Um, the last uh, of this first session presentation is uh, Robert Light. Robert, are you with us and connected? Yes, sir. Good morning. Howdy. Uh, yes, so please tell us. Uh, I, I wanted to, the reason this is on the agenda, folks, is that there's lots of different communications that are going on in the state, but one kind of standout example, if you have not experienced this, is the way that uh, Tesla tries to help answer people's questions about these kind of new cars. So I wanted to let Robert, who is one of the leaders for Tesla Tennessee, talk a little bit about what they do. Okay, um, I, I mean, as he said, I am one of the leaders of Tesla Tennessee. Uh, we have about 1500 members right now. Um, currently members are not paid. That's looking to change soon. Uh, many of the same issues as DET, got to pay the bills. Um, one of the ways we've supported this, this group infrastructure is to have kind of a, a knowledge tree. Um, you know, we have the individual experts on a variety of subjects from charging to vehicle use to maintenance, um, but we have, you know, co-chairs or vice presidents that we have, you know, I won't go with minions, but sub experts and everything. So we're able to get everyone answered quickly um, and with, with more importantly, with correct answers. Um, we, we do updates on vehicles, charging, um, cold weather, tinting, range features, how to buy, when to buy. Um, we have a wide range of expertise in the group. I forgot to start my timer, rats. Um, one of the ways we manage, I mean, if you're on a Facebook group of any size, you may have experienced that they're not always polite and pleasant to be around. One of the ways we manage this is with a fairly iron fist. Um, we have rules and we enforce them. Um, the rules are reasonable. Um, you know, they boil down to don't be a jerk. And we don't spend a lot of time processing you if you are a jerk, you're just out. Uh, we are, are believers in the paradox of intolerance. Um, if you act up, if you make the group less fun for others, you're gone. Um, one of the uptakes of this is we double our membership about, I mean, for the last several years, last couple of years, we have doubled our membership every 12 months. Uh, that's how we have 1500 now. Um, but even at that, we turn away 22% of our applicants. We just don't, you know, if you look like a spammer in Hyderabad, mm, you're probably not getting in the group. Uh, we just don't need trouble. Um, another way we manage a group that large is many people ask the same things. You know, everyone asks. How can I get my tires balanced? How, you know, who can install tinting? Uh, who can install my L2 charging? 
So we have a fairly extensive FAQ, frequently asked questions. Um, I think it's probably eight to 10 pages at this point that we encourage everyone to read upon joining the group. Um, you're not the first person to ask, can you recommend a charger in Nashville? So we have a list with linky links that sends you to many of the right places. Um, in short, once we get tired of answering the question, it goes into the FAQ. Um, another way we manage the physical presence of the group is we have subgroups. Um, we know that we can pick a good restaurant or a good parking lot that's socially responsible in Nashville, but we need help organizing things in Knoxville or Chattanooga. So we have regional, excuse me, regional lieutenants that organize on the ground tasks while headquarters we manage, you know, 501c7 certification papers and insurance and that kind of thing. Um, we have a high degree of content that is created by volunteers. Um, as perspective, Facebook considers a group successful if they have a 40% seven day active. Um, this is users actually reading or, or interacting with something in a group. We have a 91% seven day active. Um, of our 1500 members, 1360 um, touched the group in the last seven days. Um, although our name is Tesla Tennessee, Tesla Owners Club of Tennessee, and we do work with Tesla corporate, um, we're all pretty open to the fact that, you know, we're kind of EV first and Tesla second. Um, we actually have an entry membership for the Tesla curious owners. Uh, many of the issues we, we take on policy, et cetera, education are the same, whether you're in an ID4, a BMW, a Volt, et cetera. So if your you know, ownership of a Tesla is not actually required to come hang with us. If you have questions on charging, the buttons may be a little different in your ID4, but we can probably help. Um, so come on in. Um, I'm. Ha! I was about to say I'm done anyway. So there. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. And Robert gets a uh, special mention because he was in an auto accident recently. So not only is he recovering, but he made it to um, the, the town hall and, and to help us out and explain some of this. So thank you, Robert, for going above and beyond the call of duty. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I think we're to our question section. And before we let folks unmute and pose questions, Ainsley, do we want to look at some of the questions that were put in chat that may or may not have been answered? Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple that I think um, would benefit hearing uh, the whole group hearing from. The very first one, let me go back. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, one about old batteries. Yes, there was one about battery recycling. And I think if we could just touch on that a little bit, that's one of our, one of the bigger issues that we get a lot of questions about is what happens with the batteries when, when we're done with them. And what else, we, we know a little bit about this, but between, you know, uh, several of the people that are with us, some folks may know more. I mean, certainly we know that there are numerous initiatives where, for example, the LEAF, it's been one of the vehicles that's been around the longest, um, that they are using batteries in programs to, e even if they only have 60% efficiency at the end of their life, they get reused in batches to provide battery power somewhere. But, but Drew, do you have comments or, on this? Yep, that's where I was gonna go, Jonathan. I was gonna say, there's, before you recycle the battery, there are several companies out there that are looking at taking that battery putting it into a second life application. Um, there's still some questions on the viability of that from just a straight up business perspective. Um, as battery prices continue to decline for new batteries, it's not a great market for used batteries out there. But once you get past second use applications, you see some of the comments coming in the chats right now. You know, these batteries are recyclable. It becomes a business and a scale question. And if you keep tabs on the Department of Energy, 
there is lots of money out there right now to work on lithium ion battery recycling processes and supply chains. Um, it's just my opinion, it's a, it's a matter of supply and demand. When there are lots of used EV batteries to be recycled, I believe the businesses will be able to step in and recycle the important bits out of them um, when that time comes. All right, so we also, I think um, we had a, a brief question, but I think it'd be good to touch on. Um, what if someone is interested in joining one of our working groups? Where should they go and what should they do? If you, probably the best thing is just to use the contact form that's on Drive Electric Tennessee and give us some of your, at least name and, and phone number and email and uh, let us know what group you'd like to join and we can get in contact with you to um, um, make sure you get on the right email list, answer any starting questions you have. So um, Daniel, would that be info at driveelectrictennessee.org if they just wanna send an email direct without using the form on our website? That's correct. Yeah. Info at driveelectrictn.org is um, where you can send um, requests for information, including your interest in joining a working group. Um, we, we introduced Savannah Robertson, our new Drive Electric Tennessee coordinator earlier in the call. Um, she's going to be starting in earnest with us in, in uh, early August, and she will also be uh, a primary resource for you if you're looking to get involved in Drive Electric Tennessee really in any way. Savannah is going to be one of your first lines of communication for uh, getting started. All right, so we had another question um, from Bill was asking, will there be a discussion of group fleet possibilities for muni municipalities? Um, I don't believe we're having a discussion about that today. However, is there anywhere we can direct Bill or is this a conversation we can have in another capacity? And, and Bill, let, let me clarify, do you mean group purchases? Let's just say yes. Let's say that's maybe what Bill was asking. This, this is Alexa. I can quickly chime in there. Um, I will note that there is a Tennessee statute that prohibits um, Tennessee municipalities from purchasing off of kind of group buys that are external to Tennessee, such as the ones that source well and fleets of the future and those sorts of groups have created. So with, with regard to vehicles specifically, so Tennessee local governments are not able to participate in those bulk procurements, but uh, we have confirmed that uh, Tennessee local governments could in theory create their own um, kind of bulk procurement if it was like one Tennessee municipality and another combining together their, their bulk procurement in order to try and drive that economy of scale. So that is something can, that can be done within Tennessee. Um, but as far as I know, I don't know of Tennessee municipalities that have leveraged that to date. Laura, I don't know if you have any additional comments on that topic. I would just add that we need to spend a little bit more time and work on this. And at least probably one of the things we need to do is figure out, is it the sustainability officer, the fleet manager, the purchasing agent, who might be the point person from a different city that we could involve in a group discussion, because certainly one of the things we'd like to see that might yield some savings would be like group buys of leafs, bolts, et cetera. Um, so I, I think that is something, Bill, we should probably work on a little bit more. It started in some kind of initiatives and, and small projects we were working on, but not a, a statewide thing. So I'm making a note to see if in the next maybe by September, we can try to see if we can pull together at least a session for municipalities to discuss that. All right, so we have um, a question that was asked and answered in the chat, but it's again, I think something that would benefit the whole group. Um, what is involved with installing a level two charger at your home? For the sake of simplicity, I would just say, it's, it's kind of like installing a dryer, 220, 240 volt, um, you're going to need a licensed electrician to put that in. You're going to have to have the necessary slot in your uh, um, box to be able to use a 30, 40, 50, 60 amp circuit uh, connect to it. But yeah, you need a licensed electrician to be able to do that installation. Um, and I, there's lots of discussions on Facebook about that. You can get information there, even in different groups. There's discussions about what electricians in different communities 
have done some of those installs. And so people will make comments about who did theirs in Memphis or Nashville or, or Knoxville or elsewhere. And we, we can spend more time going into that, but for the sake of time, let's go to the next question, Ainsley. Okay, these are two questions that are, um, I can answer very briefly. Um, it was, is there an email list of DET members as well as will today's presentation be posted to on the DET website? Um, I'll go ahead and answer both of those. Um, yes, we will try to have this presentation posted either on the DET website or to YouTube, and then we will link it to the DET website um, in a timely manner as soon as we possibly can, as well as, yes, we do have an email list. Um, it is not a publicly available email list, if that's what you're asking. However, if you would like to join that email list um, and receive our biweekly newsletter, as well as get other information, um, I believe, is there a contact form on the DET website for that? Or would I need to, Daniel, you may have a better answer for that one. Yeah, if you visit driveelectrictn.org, there are multiple places on, uh, on the site where you'll be able to sign up for Drive Electric Tennessee news and email updates. All right, and I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. Would anyone like to turn on their microphone and ask any, uh, any other quick questions? Well, I, I have one quick one just to make sure. Drew, I think you responded and the, the document, the site host guide is not finished. It's still a couple of weeks or months away. I'd we'll have to go back and figure out if we put a final, final version on it, but it is substantially done and we'll get it on the website when it is in its final version. Uh, and then we can also send it out if people want to see it. Thank you. Okay, anybody else have a question before we move to the next session? You are welcome to unmute and ask your question if you would like. Real quickly while we're waiting, um, Neely asked a question about um, Level three charger or DC charger charge a hybrid vehicle. There's some conflicting info out there. So first of all, just in terms of kind of nomenclature, a hybrid vehicle um, will not plug in, but it improves fuel efficiency of a base gasoline car by using braking to create electricity and put it in a small battery and power the car. Once you get past a hybrid, you end up with the plug-in hybrid, uh, which has both, but also plugs in to fill the battery before you start driving. But if I drive from Knoxville to Nashville and I don't have any more electric driving space anymore, I can use gasoline to continue going in the car. Then you have a battery electric vehicle, a BEV, it's its called, which means an all electric vehicle and it only plugs in. So hybrids themselves do not plug in. Plug in hybrids, you are going to typically see level two as the only way you would charge those. I can't think off the top of my head of a plug in hybrid vehicle that has DC fast charging. And one of the reasons for that is typically you're looking at numbers that could be 10 to 40 to 50 miles that a plug-in hybrid would go on electric alone. So most often that is going to get enough power from home charging. So you're typically not going to see fast charging in a plug-in hybrid, although I could probably say that and somebody will point out the example case where that's not necessarily true. There's some plug-in hybrid that has one. Okay, so um, I think we've answered all those questions. What we're gonna do is we're gonna transition to our next session and we're doing pretty good on time. Um, Daniel Sixay is gonna become the moderator for the panel discussion. And then our last session, which is on projects and some example tweets. I do wanna real quickly just make sure that Travis, Kent and Becky, can we hear you guys? Will you unmute and say hello, please? Hello. Got you, Travis. Hello. Hello, this is Kent Meadow. Got you, Kent. Becky's here. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Can't hear you. Thank yeah. you very much. Excellent. Okay. Um, I will pass the torch to you, Mr. Sixay. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, happy to be here and to talk a little bit about uh, one aspect of Drive Electric Tennessee's work that has been kind of a priority for us from the beginning. We've just been starting to 
um, build out some of the ways in which we're we're approaching this topic in Tennessee. So I'm I'm joined today by uh, five folks who are all in various different ways working on the problem of uh, making sure that underserved communities have access to electric vehicles and EVSC. Um, Tennessee is a di is a diverse state. Uh, many different uh, economic diversities, cultural diversities, location-based diversities. So there is no good one-size-fits-all option for EVs. We need to do work to make sure that everyone can enjoy the environmental, the fiscal, and the health benefits of electric vehicles because everyone deserves them. Um, so I'm joined, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to invite each of the panelists today to spend a little bit of time, a minute or two, just talking a little bit about some of the ways in which they're working on this topic. Uh, and I'd like to start with Travis Reed from TEA, who's going to be talking about the muddy problem. Thanks, Daniel. Um, go to the next slide. So the way that we've been tackling this is through a mechanism that we're calling our think tank. So we pulled together folks from, you know, EV owners, a lot of folks who are part of this team, automakers, advocacy groups, our local power companies, state and local governments, and obviously us, to figure out how we can really address these problems in a systematic way, bringing all the right folks to the table to solve for this. So this think tank is a new concept that we're testing, and we're looking at um, tackling one problem a year with it. And this year, it's really around... Um, charging for non-homeowners. So you can go to the next slide. When you think about Tennessee as a whole, 40% uh, of the residents here rent. So they don't own the house. They don't have the access to be able to install a charger there. So this is something that we knew was going to be a real issue. So before we kicked off the think tank this year, all the members went out and interviewed different folks in their networks and their communities that they uh, live in and figured out, you know, what is the barriers that they're currently facing? What is their personal experience? And so what we found is that um, renters, uh, multi-dwelling units um, don't currently have access to charging. And this is because the upfront cost of purchasing an EV feels daunting and they do not have control over their access to a charger at home. So we're looking to give them potential, these potential drivers exposure to an EV to see how it could fit into their life permanently. So we go to the next slide, what we're looking at doing for this program over the next couple of months actually is some A-B testing. So we're gonna partner with some construction partners, some apartment owners, investment type companies and our local power companies to test what it looks like for folks who live in an apartment that have a charger available or folks who live out of an apartment who don't have a charger available, letting them use a car for two weeks and see what that looks like. And then based off of that learning, we're going to try and solve and create some experiences that make EVs a delight for them in their life. Thank you, Travis. Uh, next on our panel is Kent Minot, who uh, works with the Sierra Club and the Harvey Broom Group in, uh, in Knoxville. Uh, and Kent is uh, here to talk a little bit about rural EV ecosystems. Kent, thanks for joining us. Yeah, sure thing, uh, Daniel, nice to be here. Um, well, uh, th this will be fairly short. Um, the uh, Tennessee uh, chapter of the Sierra Club has a state transportation group and uh, they broke me into chairing that. And we've done a few things that are interesting. One of the inspirations we had was visiting Jonesboro, uh, Tennessee, where the first electric school bus in the state arrived a couple of months ago. And uh, I noticed by looking at the panelists that uh, gave little speeches there while they were cutting the ribbon for the bus, uh, there was the local power company, Bright Ridge. There was TVA, a big utility. And there was Daniel Salyers, David Salyers from TDEC. So he had the state, big utility, small utility. And I noticed that this was the same funding mechanism that had been used in Fargo, North Dakota. If you've ever seen the movie Fargo, uh, you might be reassured to know that Fargo has electric school buses now, and they use the same funding mechanism of small utility, the big utility, and the state to help out. So using that inspiration now, friends in Hawkins County and one of them, Bill Cornrich is on this call, I see, and is asking some good questions. Um, and another in Clarksville, uh, we're going about educating uh, local uh, decision makers 
in uh, city councils and school boards and county commissions about electric vehicles and how they can save people money. Because we noticed in Jonesboro that uh, many of the people who spoke uh, were touted their conservative credentials and uh, uh, they really liked saving the taxpayers money. And so we've got a bunch of presentations showing how electric vehicles and municipal fleets, things like police cars and school buses, transit buses, and just the ordinary vehicles like uh, cars and pickup trucks that people drive around in can save a ton of money for cash strapped uh, local um, uh, uh, counties and cities. And so that's basically it. We're in the middle of it right now, so we don't have any big successes to report, but we're meeting uh, with the Clarksville City Council on August uh, 5th. And uh, we'll let you know the results of that uh, when we find them, when we find out. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ken. Uh, the next member of our, or uh, contributor to our panel is uh, uh, Marty Young. Marty works at Roan State Community College. He is an EV driver and an EV advocate. Um, and, and one of the best uh, advocates for purchasing and the availability of used EVs that I have ever met. And Marty is gonna to talk to us today about the used EV opportunity. Sure, good morning, good morning. Well, first thing, I drive a used EV. Uh, this is my 2016 Chevy Volt. So a little plug there for Chevy, Josh, that's for you. Uh, and this, this car is fantastic. I love it, it's the best car I've ever owned. Uh, but the first thing, my first message really to people is there are used EVs. Uh, it's amazing how many folks I encounter at EV ride and drives that aren't aware of the fact that you can buy a used one. Uh, so that's the first message. And so along that lines, one of the things that we did with the Knoxville Electric Vehicle Association was we created what you're looking at right here, a used EV shopper's guide. Uh, this is a one-page document. What you're seeing is the front and back here simultaneously. And we've got it divided into four sections. <coughs> we have the under 10,000, uh, and then under 20,000, under 30,000, and then where to buy. Uh, this obviously is not an exhaustive guide. Uh, what we did was we tried to focus on the vehicles that are really uh, most readily available, especially in Tennessee. Uh, and also we chose ones that could be serviced locally, uh, especially in the Knoxville area, since you know, we're the Knoxville EV group. So this is why, for example, you don't see the Hyundai and Kia uh, EVs on there because the closest service center for those vehicles is Atlanta. Um, but uh, yeah, and so it's just, it's been really a lot of fun to share this information with folks uh, that there are these vehicles out there. Uh, they are, a you know, relatively affordable. It depends on sort of what your price range is. Uh, we get lots of questions about used EVs regarding battery degradation and things like that. And we can talk more about that in the Q&A if you want. Uh, in the where to buy section, this is something that a lot of people uh, have questions about. Where can you get them? I bought mine at CarMax. Uh, like I said, mine's a 2016. I bought it in 2019 at CarMax. I have a funny story about that buying experience that I can share later. Um, but uh, anyway, they are out there, they're available, and this is a message that we're trying to spread to people. Thank you, Marty. Thanks for the work that you do as well. Uh, the next contributor to our panel is uh, Becky Williamson, who works with Memphis Light Gas and Water. And Becky is gonna talk to us today about EV adoption in a large, diverse city. Becky, thanks for joining Good us. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for making a slide for me. I did not send you one, so you did a great, great job. Um, so as of June the 30th, um, from the, the TDEC Tennessee Department of Revenue numbers, there are 1,455 electric vehicles registered in Shelby County, uh, which is about a 23% jump from the end of last year. So we're definitely seeing customers starting to buy more and more of these vehicles. Um, there are approximately 120 level two charging stations in Shelby County, which is MLGW service territory. And about 13 of those are Tesla superchargers or other DC fast chargers. So we're, we're in the early stages of adoption, as you can imagine, which sort of makes our entire market underserved because it's new. So I'm going to tell you the five things that Methods Like Gas and Water has been working on in the EV space. Uh, we spent the last two years getting plugged in with Drive Electric Tennessee. We were part of the group that helped put together the DET roadmap. Um, and we've just been working with partners and committees to look at 
consumer awareness and um, charging infrastructure availability as part of our research because MLGW is in the, the early stages of developing a sustainability plan as well. So EVs will fit in there both for internal operations as well as our customers. Second, we've started discussions with some major fleet owners to understand their EV adoption plans because as you put EVs into your fleet, you now need charging infrastructure, which means it's a new electric load and we have to coordinate that growth of the system to serve that new load. Um, you'll hear from Matta in the next panel and they're one of the customers we've been talking with because they have some nice aggressive plans. Um, we've been strategizing how to encourage uh, developers to include EV charging in both multifamily developments as well as commercial developments. Um, those are areas where people don't necessarily have a carport or a garage in which to plug in for level one charging. So they're going to have a need for that. And we are seeing a huge growth in multifamily uh, construction in our service territory. So um, a few developers are reaching out. And we're trying to figure out how to uh, give them the best assistance while we don't have incentives. So what we have discovered is they need to turn it in as a load for a little EV charging station, you know, that's separate from a specific unit so that they can get additional credits at this point. Um, we've been working with local EV owners and DET to help set up a DET chapter in Memphis. This is something we've started very recently using the chapter development guide that one of the awareness committees helped put together. Um, so looking at future activities, which will probably be a lot of ride and drive events once we get to the point where Shelby County is ready to do those sorts of social activities because COVID has really put a wrench in a lot of our plans. But um, as some of the other speakers have mentioned, as Marty just mentioned, it's going to be very important to talk about used EVs because not everybody in Shelby County that you want to talk to is going to be able to go out and spend $30,000, dollars $80,000 on a new car. So talking about the availability of those used cars, Somebody else has, has enjoyed them for the first few miles. They've taken the depreciation hit, and now they're available for another consumer to purchase. Um, and there are a lot of them out there. I did a little Googling around just to see myself. So there's a lot of affordable EVs out there at very affordable prices. And lastly, um, we've put together a Zoom session that some of the people on today's panel will be speaking on uh, called Plugging into Electric Vehicles, and it's going to occur on August the 26th to educate our customers about EV technology, about vehicle features, charging infrastructure, and just all sorts of things that they need to know because they're inquisitive or they're, they're contemplating a purchase. Um, our hope is that many of those attendees will want to share their contact information. So we have sort of a distribution list for future communications, and some of those people might also want to join the chapter or attend some events. So if any of you guys are interested in that, um, that Zoom session on the 26th of August, you can find it on Eventbrite and register that way. And I'll give somebody else a few seconds. <laughs> Thank you very much, Becky. Last but not least, certainly not least, uh, our final contributor to the panel is Philip Puglisi with CARTA, and he's going to talk to us today about the electrification of public transit. Thanks for joining us, Philip. Thank you, Daniel. Um, CARTA serves people in the community who, due to age, disability, economics, or choice, are unable to operate an automobile, whether ice or electric. Uh, CARTA is best known for our electric shuttle fleet, which has been operating as a downtown circulator with battery electric shuttles since 1992. In 2019, CARTA launched its BYD, which you see on screen, which is a 35-foot battery electric bus, which is also equipped with wireless inductive charging. Uh, we have three of those in service currently with an additional four 30-foot BYD buses en route to us now and additional vehicles from Gillig uh, Bus Corporation uh, coming in the near future. Uh, so we anticipate expanding our electric vehicle fleet, providing service to all members of the community, um, especially those in underserved neighborhoods uh, and those who have needs for public transportation. In addition, CARTA is working to create a, an ecosystem of electric vehicles, including a public bike share system uh, that includes e-bike technology, as well as in 2016, CARTA developed a public charging network of 64 charging ports, level two, across 22 site locations. And for three years, we operated a, a 21 vehicle public car share system, uh, which we hope to reintroduce back into the network uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, perhaps Volkswagen would want to participate in that. So we continue this effort with um, public funding uh, from Department of Energy and National Science Foundation 
on how to make these efforts uh, especially accessible in underserved neighborhoods. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. A pleasure to have all five of you here with us today. I wanted to open up uh, the panel discussion with a kind of a more uh, speculative question. There's, I mean, as you just heard, for those listening, there are a huge number of ways to approach the, the issue of reaching underserved communities in Tennessee with electric vehicle availability and adoption options. Um, and it can seem a little bit overwhelming at first because there's just so many different vectors by which we uh, need to be addressing these problems. So I wanted to pose a question to our panelists. If you could do one thing right now, one first step towards getting us to the point where we are achieving equity in the availability and the access to electric vehicle technology in Tennessee, what would you do? What would, what would be your number one thing? I'd like to start by asking Kent this question, but then I'm, everyone else feel free to jump in. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, getting uh, electric vehicles accessible to poor people is really important. Number one thing I think I would uh, advocate for is a um, ride share, an electric ride share service in low income communities so that uh, the really low income people wouldn't have to own the car, but they would have access to it, perhaps on an app on their smartphone so they could call up the car or the cars would be stationed at a depot in the neighborhood. And then they could use it to take someone to the hospital, go shopping and stuff like that. I've got other ideas, but that's my number one. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, Ken, Ken I think- that's a great idea. Um, so, so I would say, let's fast forward a few years. We have more EV models available, which means we have more models at more price points to purchase new. And we also have more current owners, perhaps upgrading to newer EVs. So now we have more used EVs on the market. Yeah, absolutely. And, and following up on Kent's uh, idea, I saw something recently uh, on a news program and it was a gentleman who takes older worn out uh, ice vehicles, fixes them up and basically donates them to uh, working poor families so that they have a way to get back and forth to their jobs. I would love to see uh, some, it could be a 501c3 or some organization which basically purchases uh, older used uh, Nissan Leafs. They may only have 60 miles of range left, but that's plenty for most people and be able to, you know, either be part of a ride sharing thing like Kent's talking about, or actually just outright donate them, uh, you know, to some working poor so that they can get back and forth to their jobs. I think that would be an excellent, excellent use of those older, uh, you know, kind of first generation Nissan Leafs. And I definitely agree with more education around the used EV market, making people aware that, you know, you can probably get a first generation Nissan Leaf for $5,000. But I also think it's really important, the multimodal transportation, you know, knowing that there are electric buses or electric shuttles, bikes and scooters for last mile. I think education around that and giving folks access to that's highly important as well. Philip, I imagine you probably have something <laughs> something related to say to what Travis just said about multimodal transportation too. Absolutely. We strongly support both Kent's and, and Travis's ideas. Uh, we're working with the Chattanooga Department of Transportation with a, a Tennessee Multimodal Access Grant to further develop um, neighborhood multimodal uh, mobility hubs that include electric bike share, uh, bus stops, of course, and the future potential to add things such as, um, you know, electric vehicle charging and ideally, you know, the, the shared mobility solution, giving people the opportunity to choose the right transportation tool for the right trip, whether that be walking, biking, transit, or your own automobile. Thanks, Philip. And this discussion about providing people with opportunities, I think that's that's fantastic. Uh, and there's there's an element of that 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 you know we've been experiencing um, through our outreach for the license plate program right now, which is that there is whether justified or not a lot of skepticism right now about EVs being introduced into Tennessee. And as I've mentioned, and we've all mentioned today, Tennessee is a diverse state. 
It's diverse politically, it's diverse economically, it's diverse in terms of the kinds of areas in which people live. Uh, and there, there are certainly many myths about EVs. Uh, there are kind of political motivations surrounding uh, electric vehicles and you know, their role in the transportation landscape. There's also just skepticism of what's often, often seen as kind of the corporatization of transportation where you have um, uh, federal grants and, and uh, large amounts of money being, being introduced into a, into a field, a transportation field where uh, you know, a lot of people would be able to work on their vehicles at home. Now all of a sudden there's new technologies and maybe there's specific places where you have to get them repaired. So there's there's some perhaps legitimate skepticism about electric vehicles as well. I wanted to ask the, the panelists and, and maybe Becky, I'd like to start with you. How what is what are some ways to address that skepticism without necessarily telling people, well, you're unfounded in some of that? I mean, how do we how do we get people to the point where they understand the true benefits that electric vehicles can offer? both personally and uh, uh, also uh, for their communities. And it sounds like Kent also has something to contribute here as well. Yeah, I, I, think, it's, I think it's going to depend upon seeing more people driving these vehicles. And, and not necessarily more people like those of us on the phone, but more people that, that culturally um, are relatable to, to the different diverse populations in our communities, right? So I think we need to find low income customers who are driving EVs and let them tout to that segment of the population. I think we need to find small businesses who are interested in EVs and letting them communicate with other small businesses. So it's sort of a peer to peer relationship rather than just looking at the people who are fortunate enough to have to have invested in a Tesla. So um, I think it's really going to take this this broad based approach. And that's where I think having local DET chapters with a, a diverse um, leadership from across the community will help to reach into all segments of the population. And you, you have your hand raised. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just, I wanted, this is not directly an answer to this current question, but it was how do, uh, <clears throat> how do we help EV adoption among low income people? And uh, I just wanted to point out the, the fairly obvious thing when you look around the country is that all the areas that have high levels of EV adoption have one particular method that's common to them all, and that is give people money to get electric cars. They give rebates and incentives that are, are cash-based. And um, here in Knoxville, we advocated for an incentive for people to get a home charger installed in their home, and now we've got it. They'll give us 400 bucks to install that home charger. I think Holston Electric Cooperative does the same thing. And I don't know if there are any other LPCs around the state who do. But um, I know that the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power provides a $1,500 rebate to people who uh, register a used electric vehicle in the service area. And I think advocating that is a great idea here in Tennessee because some utilities are perfectly willing to do the, the rebates and think of it, they'll ultimately get the money back in charging costs. That, that's my comment. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of piggybacking on what Kent was saying, and this ties into something Travis brought out, you know, a, a first generation Nissan Leaf, you know, 2011, 2012, in that range, yes, you can buy those for around $5,000. Uh, if you had a rebate system uh, where folks could get you know, $1,500, $2,000 back on a used EV, suddenly now they can get one for $3,000. Uh, and it meets all their needs for around town driving back and forth to work. They don't even need a level two charger at home because with, you know, the relatively low mileage that they would be using each day, they just plug it into a 110 outlet and it's ready to go the next morning. Um, so those types of things would be, would be really helpful. Yeah, and I'll also say a little bit to what Becky was talking about when we went out and did some consumer research and interviewed people, they don't care about corporate talking points. So we can put all of our marketing, all of that stuff out there, but they don't identify or look to utilities or big corporations to give them advice about what their personal investments are going to be. So I think finding ways that we can deal with influencers or people in their community that they connect with, that they look to for advice. If we can amplify their voices, we're going to have much more success than trying to put out our corporate talking points. Uh, I think we've heard everyone um, everyone's contributions to that question except uh, Philip. Uh, 
I don't have anything to add. Daniel. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, Marty, you gestured at it earlier, but I wanted to follow up on, on one of the things you mentioned. One of when I when I'm speaking with folks about used EVs, one of the first questions I get is about batteries. It's like, sure. oh, I know that it's maybe three or five thousand dollars for a used EV, but I don't know the status of that battery. I you know may, I might have to replace it for ten thousand dollars in right. uh, in, a, in a year or two. That that makes me really anxious, um, and it strikes me that that's probably one of the most important pieces of factual information to to provide to folks who are looking to purchase a used EV is what is the story on bat battery degradation? Right, right. Well, one of the questions that I get most frequently when I do ride and drives, especially with my Volt, is how long is the battery going to last? Uh, and I'm honest with them and I basically say, uh, we don't know. Uh, and the reason is because the Chevy Volt uh, came out really the end of 2010. I think it really hit showrooms around 2011. Uh, and so it's been out for about 10 years now. And a lot of those very first volts are still on the road and they're doing fantastic. They're doing great. Uh, is battery degradation a real thing? Yes, it is. Typically it's not nearly as much as people think it is. Uh, we're kind of, I'll be honest with you, the Toyota Prius uh, has really kind of hurt us in some ways uh, because there are folks that have had Toyota Priuses for a long time uh, they've had issues with degradation in their Prius and it has the battery has to be replaced, et cetera. You know, there's reasons for that. It's a very small battery. Uh, and so it's getting used really pretty heavily. Uh, and also there's no thermal management on that battery. So it's, just, it's not typical for the type of batteries that we have in a lot of our larger EVs. Uh, same issue with some of the early Nissan Leafs. There was battery degradation on some of those early ones, especially in folks that were in really hot climates. Um, but, you know, most early Nissan Leafs are still doing well. So, you know, battery degradation is a thing, but it's not as big a thing as most people think it is. And what I tell people is, uh, you know, how much range do you need? So, you know, find that out, you know, kind of see how many miles you drive in a day and record that every day for like a week. So you can kind of get an average, you know, like, you know what, on an average week, I'm driving 20 miles a day. Uh, and then what I say is, you know, when you're looking for a used EV, especially one that might be a second vehicle and it's just the around town vehicle, try and find one that can do at least double your daily average. Uh, and that will take care of your needs 99.9% .9 of the time for your around town driving. Uh, and you know what, if an early model Nissan Leaf only has 55 miles range left, you know what, if your daily driving only requires 20, uh, that's still double what you need and you're in great shape. Thanks, Marty. Uh, it looks like Kent has his hand raised, uh, and then I'd love to open the floor to, uh, to, to questions for our panelists today. Kent, uh, I, I think Linwood had his hand raised first. If we can, let's let Linwood speak. Sure. Linwood? Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, I was wondering, will anybody talk about electric vehicle funding because I'm trying to figure out a way to secure funding to help inject electric vehicles into underserved communities. I would start off and just say that there are several things going on Linwood where we are trying to work more on, you know, both rural and, and underserved low income, limited income communities in terms of different facets of projects. You know, I'm just making some notes from what folks are saying in terms of trying to get, as Becky was talking about a few minutes ago, this the importance of building these chapters across Tennessee and getting each of those chapters to spend some time focusing on doing ride and drives for, for um, lower income communities. I don't know if that's gonna end up in funding. Um, I did like Kent's idea. I don't know if it would have legs where if we somehow got the state to fund people to buy a used EV to try to help um, some of the low end market and expand some of the vehicles in that way that I would love to see that come to fruition. That's probably a discussion with a number of people, but, um, so I don't know if there's any direct funding right now. I will ask one question of the group and I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, but the current tax credits that are set up are only for buying new vehicles. Is that correct or incorrect? I believe that is 
That is, yes, that, I believe that is correct. It's only for new per, new vehicle purchases. Yes. I will agree that's correct. Okay. So, so Linwood, there's, there's not a lot um, out there right now in that terms of funding, but that doesn't mean that we can't get um, some of our working groups or the right group of people trying to figure out what systems, um, what ways might we be able to try to create some incentives like that. It could also be something that could be utility-based. Uh, it could be community-based. You know, Knoxville or Memphis could get together and try to find a foundation that would work on, you know, we get we get uh, $200,000 in a pocket and we'll offer $2,500 in local incentive to get limited income families that, that pass a certain uh, bar or, or have some kind of measurable way to, to confirm that that is um, the state that you would be able to get some funding. So there's different ways we could try to tackle this. I don't know of anything right now that is direct funding assistance. If anybody else does, please feel free to speak up. Okay. Uh Thanks, because one challenge that I have is that I'm a for profit, and if you're a nonprofit, it's obvious that you know it's quite a quite a few more opportunities. But for but for profits, uh, it seems like the best route is to try to uh, uh, partner with a nonprofit. So that's I'm open to doing that because I have a proposal already. And I just I'm just trying to find a nonprofit to partner with. Well, I mean, you can get in touch with us, Linwood, and we can try to talk with that more more with you. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you're Memphis, Knoxville, or Clarksville, where you are in Tennessee, but we can have more of a follow-up conversation with you and see how we can help. Okay, thanks. And uh, Kent, I'll, I'll return the, the floor to you. I think you had one more thing to contribute before we open the, fo the floor further for questions. Yeah, yeah, just a little comment on uh, the battery degradation that Marty was talking about. Uh, I have a friend who replaced the battery in his 2011 Nissan Leaf. And uh, he was coming right near to the end of the guarantee. And actually he got five days, he was five days late in get getting the battery to degrade enough so that it, it, he would qualify for the, for the um, uh, guarantee. But um, <clears throat> he went to the Nissan dealership and talked them into giving it to him anyway. So they did replace the battery on his 2011 Nissan Leaf. So it no longer went 75 miles on a single charge. It went 105 miles on a single charge. So the new battery takes you farther. Um, one idea I think would help low income residents would be if there were a rebate for battery replacement on older EVs that would up the range even uh, above its original range when it was new. Thanks, Ken. Um, all right, with that, I will open the floor for questions. I know we had one question that was uh, that was uh, above, and uh, it was a question about state uh, and federal contracts for EV options. The question was, has there been any push to include EVs or more EV options on federal and state con contracts? Now, um, our panelists are free to answer this, but I think we also have some folks on the call who might be able to, to step in as well and answer that question. This is Jonathan. I would just quickly say that I know the Nissan LEAF is on the state bid list. Um, that's something that I would love to see the right group in Tennessee. I don't know if that's a working group, a part of DET or someone else to try to get some other vehicles on the state bid list to make it a little bit easier for, for, for those at least municipalities that comes to mind first for me, um, make it easy for me, easier for them to acquire EVs. Yeah, and Jonathan, I think that's gonna be especially important as we get the electric pickup trucks coming out in the next couple of years. Cause I know a lot of municipalities in their water department, electric departments use uh, you know pickup trucks. And so thinking of like the electric uh, F-150 Lightning, for example. Hi, this is Shauna Basquez from the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. I just wanted to update folks that the state contract um, is managed by the Department of General Services Division of Vehicle and Asset Management. We've been in contact with them over the recent months to begin to add more um, electric vehicle offerings to the state contract. Um, as Jonathan said, there are a few that are currently listed, um, but we're working with them to hopefully be able to add more. Um, the, the Nissan Leaf and Chevy Volt, as Alexa just put in the chat, are already currently on it. Um, 
Others that they think will be able to add it relatively soon include the Volkswagen ID4 and the Ford F-150. It's easier for those to both be added because there's existing manufacturers that are already on the state contract. Um, but we're we're hopeful that they'll be able to continue to expand that offering as um, the months and years come by um, because they are also interested in seeing state fleets improvements in uh, electrification space. Thanks, Sean. And I think, I mean, this is a, uh, a great point that, that a few of us have made now that um, part of the, the approach to giving EV access to underserved communities is ensuring that the applications are there. The fact is that for, you know, some applications in more rural areas, for example, a small electric sedan is not going to be the solution that works for many people. We need more options. And then we've seen many of those options start to emerge on the market. But I think you're right. In the, in the coming years, we're going to see a far greater diversity of vehicle options for electric vehicles as well. And Daniel, if, if I may jump in, for the sake of time, we probably need to move to the next session. But I want to Absolutely. open up to folks to make sure you know that uh, with the Sustainable Transportation Forum and Expo this year that's going to be in October, there's going to be kind of a pre-conference day that's going to be a full day of Drive Electric Tennessee and discussions. And so I'm almost certain we're going to figure out some other aspects of underserved communities, rural communities and EVs and have a panel and more discussion that day. So know that there's, there's lots of work that needs to go on here and you'll hear more about some specific pieces, but I believe it's October 19, 2021 and the 19th will be the pre-electric day. So we, we can add that to the list of things that Ainsley has in that, that Google sheet. Um, but with that, Daniel, if we can, let's move on to example projects and fleets. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I just wanted to thank our panelists for, for joining us in this discussion. Travis, Kent, Marty, Becky, and Philip, thank you so much for your expertise and all the work that you do in Tennessee just to work on the problem of serving underserved communities with electric vehicles and also the work that you do for electric vehicle adoption in general. We really appreciate it and we're so pleased to have you on our team. And also, I just want, um, before we move forward, I know we are short on time, but I just wanted to, um, to state that uh, Drive Electric Tennessee, East Tennessee Clean Fuels, as well as all of their entities, we are very um, aware that as far as talking about underserved communities in the EV landscape, that there are, there are a lot of uh, diverse voices that are missing from this conversation, especially on this call today. I want you all to know that we are aware of this and we are taking, uh, taking, uh, taking time, effort, uh, making strides to include more diverse voices, um, especially on a several upcoming projects to make sure that this is a, an issue that we address. As a lot of us on the call understand that we can't understand the experiences of others without bringing them in and including them on the conversations about electric vehicles. Ainsley, thank you. That's a, that is a fantastic point. And, and you're right. Uh, we will be unsuccessful in our efforts to bring electric vehicles to every, every person and organization in Tennessee unless we are including the voices in the communities that we're trying to reach. Um, we need to make sure that we're doing that kind of diversification of our team and the recognition and representational work that's required to be successful as Drive Electric Tennessee. Thanks. All right, so we're gonna move into um, a section about example projects and fleets. Some of the ones that um, DET and ET Clean Fuels and separately um, and some that we've partnered with Middle West Tennessee Clean Fuels to work on. Um, so we're gonna start with Drive Electric USA, which is one of our biggest projects that we're working on right now. Um, it is a multi-state project. We've got 14 states um, currently working on it. As you can see on the map right here, spanning a significant portion of the US, um, especially with that band that kind of cuts across. Um, so, these are all drive electric programs that are in all of these states. Some of them um, are kind of at the DET level and some of them are just getting off the ground and kind of working to create best practices guides and all working together to boost drive electric programs in all these states um, for a more nationwide approach that is tailored to the states but also has some commonality across all of them. Um, and we're doing this by engaging individuals, utilities, legislators, and dealerships um, 
as long as obviously like DET does, trying to engage individual owners as well. Um, and there's seven priority areas for this project, which you can see right here. Um, so first of all, like I already mentioned, cr just creating the statewide branded EV program. So because some, some of the states involved didn't have that off the ground yet and now are starting to work on it. Um, and consumer education and local chapter development, which Jonathan is gonna talk about in a second. Utility and regulator engagement. We've been working with a lot of utilities um, across the state. A lot of the ones that were already mentioned in the working groups um, in the Drive Electric USA program, because a lot of the DAT work is considered programmatic work for Drive Electric USA. They're kind of inter very intertwined. Um, and then Drive Electric Tennessee also acts as one of the lead coalitions on this project. So we're doing more administration for creating uh, materials that go across all of the states to make sure everyone has the uh, resources that they need to be uh, tackling all of these areas. Um, and if you want more information about the Drive Electric USA project, you can go to driveelectricusa.org. Um, we have that re fairly regularly updated with new EV numbers for all of the uh, participating states, resources that are being developed, um, and information on a state-by-state -state basis on who's kind of leading, leading the charge on these programs. Thank you, Sarah. Um, if, if you would go back one slide, just wanna make a quick note. <clears throat> you know, whether it's consumer education, working with the utility um, or local power company, discussing infrastructure, especially if you're talking about a municipality or a greater region, uh, local government outreach, engaging dealers, talking to fleets, that's all of those things can be improved by chapter, um, a, a strong chapter work in a community. So, so next slide, Sarah. And, for, and, and as several people have mentioned in the notes, you know, and if, if you've heard me say it once, you've probably heard me say it about a hundred times. If you've never heard me say it, it's all about butts and seats. Um, the more you get your own experience in driving an EV, the faster it becomes even a possibility or an option in something you might purchase in the future. So one of the biggest parts of trying to develop chapters across the state is to try to hold ride and drives more frequently. And I, is there another, is the image included on the next slide, um, Sarah? Okay, and, and so after that, is there one more that has the image or maybe it's not in here? Just wanted to show people that, okay, yeah, I'll just jump to this real quick. This thing is fluid, I will tell you all, um, but there's work in some of these major areas and even in some areas, we've started to have a discussion even in Paris, Tennessee um, about developing a chapter there. But even if these circles are off and the chapters end up being bigger or smaller than some of these, as long as there's local activity to focus on probably pulling together riders, uh, drivers, EV owners in an area so that they're willing to share their vehicles along with dealerships to be able to let other people experience these, that's the most critical piece of all this. But the more we can grow a chapter, like I'll just point out Upper Cumberland here, um, the more we can get dealerships, TDEC, universities, you know, other people involved, the group beyond ride and drives can figure out how do we work on other things that could be beneficial for this particular community. And we have Dr. Ping and Chen with us, and he's going to talk a little bit about projects that, that have to do with that community. Um, but each community will have some things that are unique for them that the people in that group that are from the local area can figure out how to best tackle. So I'm, I'm almost done. If you will back up uh, two slides, Sarah. Yeah. It, there's, if you've met somebody that owns an EV, I don't care if it's a Leaf, Bolt, or whatever, you're going to be talking to someone that's passionate about this thing because they've already experienced this. So they are that passionate fan base. Uh, but obviously, if we're installing workplace charging equipment, if we want to do DC fast charge equipment, um, a, you, even if somebody's going to install something at their home, you know, you kind of need the utility involved. And so they're a critical piece, very important part of the discussions in chapter development in, in each of these areas. And next slide, Sarah. The, the hope is that maybe in by the end of 2023, we'll have about 10 chapters getting started. 
And uh, so we, we want to help people. And this work started uh, over a year ago. It is part of the Drive Electric USA project just to help fund some of our time to do this work. But the hope is that in a year or so, when you look at Drive Electric Earth Day or uh, National Drive Electric Week that happens in the fall, that instead of seeing three or four or five spots on a map for events that are taking place, we want to see 25 spots on that map because that's one of the things that's going to be critical to getting to that 200,000 in a few years. And I'm surprised that Sarah, Susan hasn't already told me time. So <laughs> um, if you have questions about chapter development, let us know, but we're, we're excited and, and going to continue working on this across the state. So Pingan, uh, if you're ready, I think it's your chance to talk about the EV testbed project. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, the, I'm so glad that everyone here is talking about this underserved community. And I have I've been working uh, with Jonathan and Alexa on these uh, two uh, DOE supported um, electric vehicle project to serve uh, underserved community. The first a uh, project you have, you are seeing on the slide is about developing a, a rural electric vehicle test bed in this uh, upper Cameron um, region in Middle Tennessee. This is uh, uh, one of the most economically distressed regions in Tennessee. So for the rural community, one the key barriers for them to adopt electric vehicle, including you know the lack of EV charging station. Uh, lack of um, the experience and lack of uh, EV availabilities from the uh, the local EV dealers, and so lack of uh, facts about EVs and outdated um, perceptions about the electric vehicles. So what we are doing in this project is trying to create a, a, a ecosystem uh, in this uh, rural uh, Middle Tennessee areas, and we're trying to. Uh, create different um, uh, activities to help rural community um, increase their EV awareness experience and help them uh, get EV education from our activities. So we have been partnered with different uh, stakeholders like EV manufacturers, um, the, the universities, clean city coalitions, and uh, local power companies. And, and it has to be kind of an ecosystem approach to build a team to work on this. And our angle is to make this a sustainable EV um, testbed, meaning after the project finished, there is a, the, 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 the rural community in this region can take off, right? So we, we are using different methods in this project, including creating two weeks EV test drive program and, and create a broad EV education and outreach events like, like webinars, EV ride and drive, show and tell events, and uh, encourage education, things like that. Our goal is trying to make sure that our activities can reach to not only a bigger cities, but actually get into a very remote uh, rural counties so that uh, they, can, they can receive uh, this EV education. This is a task that is easy to say and then done. And Jonathan and myself are currently working on planning doing this EV uh, ride and drive um, and show, uh, show and tell events in this coming fall to, to Time. get more areas. And the next project we are talking about is taking a similar approach. We are, uh, the main difference between, from this, uh, between this project and the previous project is this is about the commercial vehicle domain. And this is not about people, it's more about the delivering, the not about delivering of goods in the regional and the city applications. And this is a project um, Tennessee Tech is leading one team and partner with another team in Texas, trying to bring this um, medium duty electric vehicle to uh, the, the fleet owners, not only big fleet owners like FedEx, UPS, but mostly we are targeting the small fleet owners, which is mostly the, have five or less um, vehicles and they have very 
limited uh, funding resources to acquire the very expensive medium duty electric vehicle, this project is aimed to remove this barrier to allow them to access expensive uh, medium duty electric vehicle and operate the electric vehicle in their fleets. And then, and then understand the total cost of ownership. You understand the upfront cost is high, but through this uh, operation, a more cost-effective operation, you are able to see when you can get this uh, total cost of ownership um, uh, lower and lower as the time goes. So this is the project we are preparing the project. It haven't started yet, but we hopefully this will start uh, soon. Um, so this is the two uh, underserved community and we are working on. Thanks, Pengen. Raven, the floor is yours. Good morning, how are you guys? Well, I got two minutes, I better hurry. Um, yeah, so Earthrise is similar to Uber and Lyft, except for we utilize electric vehicles and we also employ our drivers. Uh, we launched October 1st with rides and since then we've done over uh, 50,000 passengers in the vehicles and we've offset over 200 million tons of our grams of carbon. Um, so it's it's been a fun, I guess, almost year now as we move towards August, uh, and we've just had a lot of fun getting to um, accelerate the adoption of EVs and also show people what an EV is on the streets. You know, rideshare is a great place to meet people and have them experience um, truly what it's like to be an electric vehicle. You can go to the next slide. I actually plugged in my own slides. Yeah, perfect. Um, so this is some of our fleet. We've got Tesla's Mach-E Mustang. We've also debuted the Polestar and we're working with OEMs to um, showcase some other vehicles like, we've got Violet here, like the Aria, like the Leaf, um, like the Volkswagen, the cars that are going to be a bit more approachable than, you know, a Mach-E Mustang or a Ford. Although a lot of our writers, their demographic is in the 25 to 34 year old um, range, and they are people who generally purchase a $40,000 car. And so since we've been open, we know to date that at least 10 people um, have purchased an EV after being in ours. We're looking to see if we can figure out how many are truly buying an EV after being in an electric vehicle for the first time. We've been able to do some really fun pilots with Drive Electric actually and do some different type of ride and drives where um, instead of going to a physical location for a meetup, uh, turning that first time in an EV into your rideshare experience and, and having those two blend together, having our drivers ask some of those questions and, and have them fill out a survey. It's been really fun to get people to where, we're go where they're going and also learning about it. So uh, we'll go to the next slide. I'm... <clears throat> Oh, that was too quick. Two seconds. Life program, uh, we focus on intellectual disabilities uh, for students, as you see in the right-hand side. And we actually have an ask for anyone on this call. Uh, there's a partner who's looking to purchase a, a shuttle. If it's an electric vehicle, we will do the ride. So if you guys know of any shuttles with electric vehicles, uh, we'd be more than happy to discuss. Awesome. Thank you, Raven. Um, yeah, let's, let's follow up. Raven, uh, I'm, there's numerous people on this call on this that could probably talk to you, but if you want to start with me, we can set up a time to quickly talk and look at a couple options. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is the, the project that we're currently working on with the National Fire Protection Association. Uh, we worked with the NFPA a couple of years ago to do safety training with first responders across Tennessee. We had four sessions across the across the state to engage first responders on how to safely respond to emergency situations involving alt fuel uh, vehicles. Um, that led NFPA to reach out to us to help facilitate a national program of electric vehicle training, a, a curriculum that they're going to be developing, and then um, hosting sessions, training sessions across the country in, in approximately 30 different locations over two years. Uh, now, this isn't safety training per se. What this training is, is engaging multiple, multiple different uh, groups of, of people and individuals who are, who are going to need to be involved in the process of making EV availability a thing. 
So obviously the first one is fleets and consumers. We want to be engaging them and making sure that you know we're dispelling some of the myths and misconceptions about EVs. Um, the second group is officials and facilitators, folks at utilities, urban planners, people who do the installation. We want to make sure that they have the information that they need to be able to make sure that permitting is in order, make sure there's safety involved when it comes to installing uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, uh, make sure that utilities have the ability and, and the resources they need to understand the opportunities that electric vehicles can provide to them. And then finally, last but not least, are the second responder, responders in the way that NFPA terms it, the tow operators and crash reconstruction, fire investigation, insurance adjusters. There are a lot of moving parts to electric vehicles becoming common and the most common vehicle on the road. And so these, uh, uh, these groups, uh, the training sessions that we're developing in concert with NFPA are going to be helping reach out to all three of these different groups and making sure that the resources that they need are available to them. DET in particular, we're going to be working on the portal for signing up for these sessions. We're going to be doing outreach for clean cities coalitions across the country to host these sessions. And we're also working with a few other lead coalitions to help with that work as well. This is a national project. We're really happy to be involved with the NFPA working on it. They come next. Um, so CART has been working on optimization of deployment of electric vehicles. Uh, as fleets look to electrify, it's not a, a, a mechanism that can be done immediately. Uh, due to either cost or availability. For example, buses are on, uh, electric buses are on a very long lead time. Um, so with funding from the Department of Energy, we've been looking at incorporating an, an energy map of our entire fleet system, including diesels, hybrids, and battery electrics, as well as our electric public bike share fleet, and looking at data from our prior electric vehicle car share operation. So looking at an optimization strategy using AI uh, on deployment so that if a fleet uh, does acquire a mix of ICE and electric vehicles, they can optimize that deployment strategy um, for energy efficiency uh, and other goals. Um, I would add, um, just from a research perspective, I mean, the health impacts, uh, I know Tony was on the call earlier um, from the Lung Association, um, air quality improvements as well as noise and overall economics of EV deployment is critical to our underserved communities as, as we move these projects forward. Thanks. Thank you, Philip. Um, I was just typing something into the chat box to in follow up to Dr. Chin's comment. Just if you live in the Upper Cumberland or you know anybody that lives in the Upper Cumberland, they can basically sign up. And as long as you meet the requirements, can borrow a Nissan Leaf for two weeks. So we have some you know, great programs going on in certain areas of Tennessee uh, that we need to replicate elsewhere. So um, I, I will apologize to Becky and to the rest of you. We could not get John Lancaster from uh, Memphis Area Transit Authority on the, on the phone. They are ramping up um, EV bus program uh, WECO in Nashville has some. You heard a little bit from Philip earlier about CARTA. Okay, so now Knoxville Area Transit. Um, Cy McMurray is the, used to be the fleet maintenance manager. Now he's the procurement manager, but he's been involved with their process over the last few years. And basically what they did is they, um, from a lot of their homework and testing, they ended up with a contract with New Flyer for up to 25 electric buses. If you do not know, New Flyer is a Canadian company, but their most Southern manufacturing facility is in Anniston, Alabama. It's really uh, not too far down into the state. And every once in a while, they will do tours of their plant, New Flyer, where they build a diesel, a hydrogen, an electric, and a natural gas bus all on the same line. It's a really neat tour. I was able to go on that like a year and a half ago. Um, but they have selected New Flyer. Out of those 25, they have received uh, one so far, and two more are uh, being built. So they ordered 12, but the first three are just what they're working on to start. 
they are starting to build out the infrastructure. You can see both a new transformer in that photo on the right, as well as the individual charging units and the smaller things that are sitting out next to the bollards are the basically just the cord handling systems to be able to charge the buses. But they were also awarded several other contracts, um, awards for funds, but they aren't under contract yet. That includes one to add six more buses to the total that they can buy and get some depot charging infrastructure at the transit center uh, in Knoxville. If you don't know Knoxville very well, they have a transit center that's about 10 years old. It's relatively new, closer to downtown Knoxville and then their main offices that are a little east of there, um, which is where this depot charging is. But they also have got an award for one pantograph style overhead fast charger for a bus that would be at the transit center. And they're looking to add on to that. We're talking about an ability for it to pull under, something would come down from above. We were actually looking at the rails on this um, yesterday when we were out there briefly. And uh, in five minutes, it will have a 30% charge. So it is really quick charging. Um, they are laying the conduit for up to 25 charging spots. And if you'll go ahead and go to the next page, Sarah. Yeah, so, and, and I, maybe I didn't include that other picture, but what you can't see uh, from that top photo is just off to the right is parking for about 20 other buses and they are already working all the power and the, the places and the bollards to be able to add that infrastructure um, in the coming months so that they're prepared and the infrastructure is already there as they add more buses. And that's just another shot of um, one of their buses. If you are looking at it, if you look at the, the front top of that bus, you will see what looks like some metal and something black on the end. And that is actually the pantograph charging rails. So um, certainly didn't blow that up so you could see it easily, but um, that's just an example of, of one of our mass transit agencies, kind of where they are and trying to ramp up. None of their buses are really ready for on-road use. The first one that they have is still going through testing. Um, so, but they are getting very close. They've been working on this for several years. So um, the process is started and they are making headway. So with that, I think we are to our final question session. And so you are welcome to ask a question of somebody from this session or a question about the project as a whole, the uh, town hall as a whole. While we see if anybody have questions, I will say Ainsley, I just wrote down that I noted early on, Travis mentioned their new video series that's out. So we need to add a link to that if we can. Um, Alexa put in the comments for those that did not see this new Rivian relationship and, and EV chargers that are gonna go at state parks, that was big news. So we need to put a link to that if we can. You can find all of this on the DET website under the news section. Gotcha, okay. All right, uh, last chance to ask questions. Otherwise, we very much appreciate your all's time today. We look forward to doing this um, at least once a year, but um, also looking forward to some of our other meeting opportunities coming up later this year in Tennessee. Thank you very much, folks. It's been a pleasure to be able to chat with you today. If you have any questions, please feel free to follow up. And if you um, uh, need a specific attention or have a specific question for us, you can reach us at info at driveelectrictn.org. If you want some more general information, visit us online at driveelectrictn.org. Thanks, everybody.